So the Z compiler is bootstrapping using WebAssembly, which is an interesting choice. Uh, but also in this video, I'm going to explain why it's not just interesting, uh, but also very practical and probably the best choice at our disposal right now. Uh, also, Andrew wrote a blog post, which I link in the description and where you can find more technical details. I won't go through all the details in this video. I just want to answer the more high level question. I want to give you I want to explain this from the perspective of the experience that a Zeek contributor has, well, had before and will have after this new change. So bootstrapping is sometimes, well, often referred to in the context of, oh, I have this new operating system, this new weird architecture, which nobody almost ever has, but anyway, or I'm a distro maintainer and I care about bootstrap because uh, distro maintainer stuff. I'm maybe I'll touch upon this near the end of the video, but today I want to talk about the experience of being a Zig contributor. You sit in front of your computer, haven't updated Zig in like I don't know maybe three days. You run git pull, and now you want to build the latest version of Zig to continue working on it. So here's what happens. What happened until yesterday before we uh, deleted the C++ implementation in favor of this new Bootstrap system based on WebAssembly. So before you would pull master. And then you had two ways of building the new version of Zig, uh, an updated version of Zig. One is to use your older build of Zig. So you, you had probably a Zig executable built on your computer, but it's outdated by a few days. And, but you could still use that to, do, uh, to run Zig build, build the self-hosted compiler directly and obtain a new version of Zig. Option number two, which is lower, uh, is to use the well the process that contributors know uh, by it's the one where you invoke make and it's based on uh, um, first building the C++ implementation using a, your system C++ compiler or technically you could also have used uh, the Zig executable but in this case you, you maybe you would still be using your old Zig build but in this case you're building a C++ code base right so you're not doing anything with Zig code directly which means that the fact that you're using, uh, a, since you know, Zig bundles Clang, the fact that you're using the Zig executable versus using your systems provided Clang, in practice doesn't matter much. Uh, so you use that, you use that to build the C++ code base, which gives you Zig zero from, or well, stage one, then from stage one, you build, uh, you use that executable to build the self-hosted code base, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these two things seem equivalent and they tend to be, roughly speaking, except in one case, when there are new features that have been implemented in Zig. Um, if you stayed away, I don't know, maybe a week, and in the meantime, somebody implemented uh, the new for loop syntax in the compiler and also started using it in the compiler. So keep in mind, these are two different things. One is adding support for the feature. The other is using it in the compiler. As one example, uh, the new self hosted compiler doesn't implement yet async await. Yeah, we know that if you are you if you have a program with async await, you have still to use the stage one compiler, which now has been deleted. So now you basically have to wait for the next release of the Zig, which or un, the point when uh, Andrew uh, merges his work in progress async await branch. But this is not a problem. Like this is a f missing feature of the language. But this is not a problem when it comes to self hosting because the compiler does not use async await in its implementation. So that's that's not a big deal. Now, we, what we want to do with uh, Zig is to, uh, now that we are self-hosted, we want to leverage this fact. So we want to implement new features quickly and also we want to dog food them. So we, we, want to implement, we want to implement all the backlog of accepted proposals and also we want to use them in the compiler so that we can get a feel for them, like as, as I was saying, dog fooding. Um, now here's the problem though. If you have uh, your old version of Zig, you git pull the latest version of Zig, which now is using the new for loop syntax. You try to run Zig build and it fails. It fails because your old Zig doesn't recognize the new for loop syntax. So the only way that you can build latest Zig through this process using Zig to build a self-hosted compiler directly, the only way is to check out a, a older version of Zig, well, newer than what you have, but older than the latest, and to the to the commit where for loop syntax was implemented in the compiler, but not used yet in the compiler code base. So you check out that one, build that version of Zig, and then use that version of Zig to build the latest version of Zig. 
because now your that, that let's say intermediate build of zig will support the new for loop syntax that's annoying you stay away three months five language features get implemented and now you have to run this chain of stuff uh multiple times maybe five six times something like this it's doable but it's annoying and that's uh, and that actually was the case also in the past but in the past we could always put strap to through the c plus uh, to the stage one compiler and that gives us the ability to boot to update zig in a fixed number of steps because in, even in this scenario right where now there's this new for loop syntax which is used in the self-hosted code base that wasn't a problem because because you built the C++ implementation and here's the here's also another problem to keep this working the for loop the support for the new for loop uh, syntax needed to be implemented once in the C++ code, sorry once in the self hosted code base once in the C++ code base which is annoying but that gave us the, uh, the ability to use always the C++ implementation to always be able to build latest zig in a fixed number of steps so Bootstrapping solves this problem, the problem of all these changes that impact the compiler itself. And bootstrapping through C or C++ gives you the ability to have a fixed number of steps. So you don't have to, you, it doesn't happen that you stay away six months and then you have to do this whole chain. Now, we deleted the C++ code base because the problem is that while the C++ code base gives you this property, fixed number of steps to, to build, later zig, um, it has the downside that you have to implement the same feature twice because you have to implement it once for the self-hosted code base and once for the C++ code base, uh, code base and that's annoying. So why the current process? Why WebAssembly? Well, here's the idea. We had a good bootstrap process. The problem is that it required us to implement the same thing twice. We need to implement the same thing twice because if we implement it in Zig, then we need a Zig compiler that supports this thing. It's like a, it's like a self-referential problem which causes the need for the bootstrap chain we have the ability to compile zig to c for example we have the c backend that allows us to take the zig code base compile it to c and any c compiler will be able to then give you a zig compiler so we could bootstrap through c kind of like we were before and well c plus plus now it would be c but let's say minor difference and it also um and it wouldn't require us to implement the same thing twice, right? Because it's like you just generate it with the C backend, which we have, which, which works. The problem with the C backend is that it only produces platform specific code. The C backend is only able to, the, the, the C backend by virtue of being a backend only kicks in once, cell, once semantic analysis is done, once com time has been resolved. And we use com time in Zig to implement our multi-platform stuff. You look at the standard library, there, there's going to be a bunch of uh, com time switches that swap in and out uh, uh, system dependent stuff. So like if you're targeting Linux, then OS.system, I believe, STD OS system uh, will be the Linux struct. If you're targeting Windows, you get the Windows struct, et cetera, et cetera. Problem is that we to have a good C build that's multi-platform, we would need to translate this stuff into macros, which this uh, which the C backend does not do because the C backend, as I said, only exists after this stuff has already been resolved. So what do we do at this point? Well, if we only have that option, what we can do is, of course, build a bunch of different versions. So we, we enumerate all the combinations, all the architectures, all the OSs that we support, and then create a target-specific C build for every target. The problem is that there's a ton of those, and that's each um, Zig uh, C implementation, sorry, each, each uh, C build of the Zig compiler is like 80 megabytes or something times CPUs times OSs, th that's a lot. That's really a lot. It's very verbose. So it's doable, but in practice, we don't want to do that because it would require committing like hundreds of megabytes of stuff. And uh, since this stuff is also machine generated, every time something changes, it would produce probably a lot of, of diffs. So you, you get this giant, super bloated um, repository, which you don't want. Sure, there's also tricks like compressing the source code and everything else, which, minor spoilers, it's also kind of what WebAssembly does. 
Um, but here's the thing. So the C backend is not able to do multi-platform stuff. There's a uh, produce multi-platform C code. If only there was a target that we supported with Zig that was platform agnostic, maybe some kind of virtual machine. And it turns out that LLVM has a WebAssembly backend, and that's what we use. So long story short, uh, by compiling Zig to WebAssembly, we get this binary blob that is um, platform independent. More specifically, also here's another neat uh, fact. Uh, not only we are leveraging stuff that we already have, it doesn't have to be WebAssembly, to be honest. It could be any kind of virtual machine, if you think about it. But the fact that it's WebAssembly, at least for now, means that we are utilizing stuff that we already have. We also get the um, uh, the uh, performance optimizations that LLVM is able to provide. And on top of that, um, WebAssembly, so the compiler needs access to some syscalls, like the file system, input, output, uh, standard inputs and output, this kind of stuff. And we get that um, in WebAssembly through WASI, because WASI is this standardized interface for POSIX style uh, syscalls in WebAssembly. And we wouldn't, again, just like we don't necessarily have to use WebAssembly, but it is convenient to use WebAssembly, we don't necessarily have to use WASI, but it is convenient because we implement already WASI in the standard library. So we're also able to leverage that as well. So. Long story short, um, we can now build, every time we make a change to the, to the Z compiler, we, and that change is the type of change that impacts the compiler itself. So it's syntax that we want to use in the compiler itself, or it's maybe a bug fix, a bug fix that has an impact in how Z builds itself. Like if it's a bug that only triggers when you're building, I don't know, Bork, or, or another third party project, it doesn't matter. But if it's a bug that, that used to produce slightly wrong versions of the compiler itself, then every time something like this happens, we update the, we build Zig for WebAssembly and put this build, put this, um, uh, this binary blob in the repository. And so the people this way can bootstrap it with a fixed number of steps. They don't have to do the chain thing anymore. Uh, now this is now that you understand this. This is a good moment to uh, maybe you know what end the video, wait for the video to end, and then go check out Andrew's blog post because he'll go more into the detail of how this whole process works. Uh, in practice, what, what's nice is that the WebAssembly blob it's kind of tiny, or especially if you compress it, it's like 600 kilobytes, which is much more manageable than than 80 megabyte per target. This is 600 kilobytes for all targets, um, and What else I wanted to say? I think there was some one last thing. So yeah, this way we have bootstrap in a fixed number of steps. So as as a um, compiler contributor, you can still do the same thing as before, um, and you don't have to implement everything twice. In reality, so at the end of the day, oh yeah, I remember. I have to talk about uh, bootstrapping from the perspective of distro maintainers. Okay, so uh, let me just finish about the to give you a final recap about the experience of developing the Z compiler given this new bootstrap process. So now, if you make changes to the Z compiler that are important, you don't have to implement them twice because there is no C++ implementation that we need to keep in sync. If you uh, now need to bootstrap to build Zig from scratch using the uh, systems comp C compiler as a starting point, you don't need any more like 11 plus gigabytes of RAM. Now four gigs of RAM are sufficient to be able to bootstrap Zig, which is awesome for people who have, you know, 32 bit systems or like smaller machines. Point number two. Point number three, you still can do bootstrap in a fixed number of steps. You don't have to worry about, you know, pull later Zig, oh no, it's exploding. Oh shit, now what do I do? I don't know, I, I'm going to like bisect the, the commits or like you have to read, like somebody has to tell you which is the commit that starts introducing the new stuff. It's super annoying. So you don't have to do this. You can mindlessly just run your, your make script and come back a few minutes later and it's done. Final point, this could have been done with C. It wouldn't need WebAssembly, but C, but Z can only produce uh, target specific C code. The C code that it produces is very big and bloated uh, from a like size perspective. And what WebAssembly ends up giving you 
pretty much is a form of semantic compression of the C source code. If you want to understand what I mean by this, go read Andrew's blog post. Final note, um, distro maintainers. So the current bootstrap process works if you are working on Zig, but distro maintainers will not like it. Distro maintainers don't want you to provide magic uh, binary blobs. They, they will not accept a bootstrap. Well, not everybody, but people like the Debian, for example, will not accept a bootstrap process that involves a magic uh, binary blob, WebAssembly binary blob that you provide. They, and they won't accept um, computer generated source code either. They want, you know, organic, uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, no GMO <laughs> source code. So and that's understandable. Uh, you can read more about this. Uh, you can read about uh, trusting trust and other things related to, to this point. Now, in their case, they will not be able to use the, boots, the WebAssembly bootstrap route. So from their perspective, they will have to do the thing where they check out the latest version of Zig that had the C compiler, that had, sorry, the, the, the C implementation in it, use that to build a version of Zig, and then do the chain thing until they are able to build head. That is annoying, uh, but as I understand, it's uh, temporary. Uh, hope because um, the idea is that at some point, a C implementation of the Z compiler, like an alternative C implementation of the Z compiler will come out and then that one will be, can be used um, to bootstrap Zig. But in the meantime, we are focusing on the, the contributor experience more than the distro experience because, well, the, the, the distro doesn't have a lot of use for Zig until we reach 1.0, right? Or at least we are further ahead, further along uh, with the development of Zig. So I hope that this made sense. Again, check out Andrew's blog post because he uh, gives more details about how this works. Um, and uh, that's it. If you have any questions, uh, YouTube comments, or even better, come find me uh, in my Discord server, which I, you know what, I'll also put in the description and we can chat about this stuff there. So have a nice day and see you in the next video.